Section 47 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayton. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Section 47. Chapter 46. Explanations at eleven o'clock on the following day lord ellingham who had passed a sleepless and wretched night called at the house of lady hatfield and was immediately conducted to the drawing-room where georgiana was alone in readiness to receive him she was dressed in a morning garb and though very very pale looked surpassingly lovely my dear friend she said extending her hand which, as he offered to press it with rapture to his lips, she gently but still resolutely withdrew. My dear friend, for such henceforth must I call you. Georgiana, he exclaimed, startling back, what means this coolness? Be seated, Arthur, and listen to me attentively, she said in a plaintive and sweetly touching tone. I am not very well. My nerves are not strong to-day and you must not manifest any impatience towards me indeed i ought to have postponed this interview but i considered it to be my duty a paramount duty owing alike to yourself and to me to enter into as early an explanation as possible this preface forebodes nothing favourable to my happiness murmured the earl as he sank into a seat to which georgiana pointed but which was not by her side arthur she continued with difficulty maintaining sufficient control over her emotions to enable her to speak calmly and collectedly you know not how much i love you how dearly i am devoted to you for your sake and to bear the name of your wife i could consent to become a mendicant a wanderer on the face of the earth renounce fortune rank society all in fine that we women are generally deemed to hold so dear yes all this could i do for your sake so that you were my companion then conceive how hard it is for me oh how very hard my well-beloved arthur to be compelled to say that henceforth we must know each other only as friends merciful heavens ejaculated the earl uncertain whether the imagined capriciousness of his georgiana was about to assert its tantalizing influence again or whether anything of a more serious nature and connected with the incidents of the preceding evening was about to present an insuperable bar to his happiness yes arthur continued georgiana in an impressive tone henceforth we must be but as brother and sister to each other and as a dear fond affectionate sister will i ever be to you for your generosity would have made me your wife in spite of but you cannot wish me to refer to that and yet it is that one sad episode in my life which now asserts an inexorable influence over the conduct which we must both pursue it is that event which you in the noble candour in the warm liberality of your admirable disposition you praise me too highly georgiana exclaimed the earl i loved you i loved you dearly and in spite of all that you now say hope is not quenched within me but my god when will this painful suspense pass when shall i behold you no longer a prey to an influence alas that influence must endure for ever murmured lady hatfield tears now trembling upon her eyelashes no no cried the earl with impassioned energy when but a few days ago we entered into explanations with each other when i informed you that i was aware of the nature of that secret influence which tyrannized over you did i not assure you that as a loving husband i would so completely study your happiness oh yes interrupted georgiana and did i not declare that you had given me a proof of affection such as a man seldom gave unto a woman believe me believe me she added earnestly i felt all that there was great generous and noble in your conduct for knowing that secret that sad that fatal secret you banished all prejudice discarded 
even those scruples which the most high-minded of men so often entertain under such circumstances dearest georgiana exclaimed the earl you attach far too much importance to the secret of which you speak what man that truly loves a virtuous beautiful accomplished and amiable woman would allow himself to be swayed ah every heart is not so generous as yours interrupted georgiana you recognize the complete innocence of my soul i cannot believe that you would be guilty of the wanton cruelty of inflicting these tortures upon me georgiana said the earl were it not for that strange that almost morbid state of mind which is at times produced by the recollection of a serious fright which you experienced some years ago and from the effects of which you have not completely recovered but after all wherefore do you praise me so highly wherefore do you thank me so much for the simple fact of not allowing the knowledge of this occasional access of morbid feeling to weigh with me arthur almost shrieked georgiana losing all control over herself then you know not the secret the dreadful secret yes have i not proved to you that i know it exclaimed the earl surprised and grieved at the strange manner of lady hatfield your uncle put me in possession of the facts and what is there in them after all it's a mere adventure which one would now tell only as a christmas tale or to amuse children had it not produced so serious an influence upon your nerves and arthur arthur is this a cruel pleasantry demanded georgiana hysterically or have we misunderstood each other all along you know that i am incapable of turning to ridicule or making a jest of anything that regards you georgiana returned the earl and as for my misunderstanding between us there is none our explanation the other day was full complete satisfactory no no cried lady hatfield painfully excited i see that i am mistaken that you have learnt a bare fact yes and since we are now conversing on the topic said the earl let us enter fully into it and then abandon it for ever i see that you attach much importance to this subject and that when we are united there may be no necessity ever to recur if ever we are united repeated georgiana clasping her hands in anguish of heart yes my well-beloved continued the earl and now listen to me about seven years ago you were staying alone at malevra lodge in hampshire oh the fatal time the fatal place cried georgiana hysterically and though she would have given worlds to cut short the conversation she had not the power for her mind was agitated like the ocean in a storm you were staying alone at malevra lodge proceeded arthur not observing the extent of her emotion you were alone save in respect to the servants but you had no relation no friend there at the moment and one night a man broke in a man with a black mask murmured georgiana almost wringing her hands and bearing the denomination too of the black mask continued lord ellingham this man broke into the house and and merciful heavens spare me the recital of the rest shrieked lady hatfield covering her face with her hands good god do not thus give way to a reminiscence which though painful should no longer exercise any influence over a strong mind said the earl in a kind and soothing tone as he approached and seated himself next to georgiana consider my dearly beloved my angel my intended wife reflect i implore you upon the childishness of this behaviour childishness repeated georgiana with a convulsive shudder pardon the expression said the earl but i would reason with you i would endeavour to persuade you that an occurrence which is past and gone and which happens frequently in other houses should not thus paralyse all the naturally fine energies of your soul what in the name of heaven can it matter now if a robber broke into a dwelling some six or seven years ago your uncle told me that for some months fears were entertained for your reason but oh my georgiana i do implore you now now that we are once again touching on this painful most painful theme to exercise more command over yourself you praise me you thank me because i am willing to espouse one whose reason was shocked long years ago for that is your secret after all georgiana dearest georgiana and you perceive that i know it my god 
how have we misunderstood each other murmured the unhappy lady my secret he knows it not but the earl could not catch the sense of the words which she thus whispered to herself and with a fond hope of consoling her for the events of the preceding evening were for the time banished from his memory he took her hand pressed it to his lips and began to utter syllables of tenderness and love then how terrible was his surprise how acute the anguish which filled his soul when georgiana suddenly starting from the half embrace in which he was already enfolding her exclaimed in a tone indicative of the most exquisite mental agony no arthur no you are not acquainted with my secret and now never never will you learn it we have misunderstood each other and i consented the other day to become your wife while labouring under a dreadful oh a dreadful error but heaven has interposed to prevent the consummation of your misery and mine and now she added with the calmness of despair let us separate arthur and henceforth be unto each other but brother and sister for your wife i cannot become georgiana this is cruelty the most refined the most wanton exclaimed the earl am i again to pass through all the phases of suspense uncertainty mystery and doubt and will you in a few days repent of all you have said and recall this stern decision but much as i love you deeply as i am attached to you i cannot cannot endure a treatment pardon me forgive me cried georgiana but you do not comprehend me my reason is not unhinged i am subject to no whims no caprice arthur a fatal mistake on my part alone induced me the other day to consent to become your wife that error has now been cleared up our conversation of this morning has convinced me of the tremendous misunderstanding that had nearly wrecked all your happiness there was another reason which would imperatively command us to think no more of each other in the same light as we so lately did ah you allude perchance to the incident of last evening exclaimed lord ellingham permit me then to ask the object of that rainford's visit did he insult you did he attempt to extort money from you if so no no cried georgiana in whose bosom the mere mention of the highwayman's name appeared to excite the most agonizing feelings i sent down a message to that effect last night he did not insult me he did not come to injure me but his presence excited you most painfully georgiana interrupted the earl and it has also revived in your imagination oh i understand it all he cried suddenly interrupting himself this rainford is the black mask the noted highwayman of hampshire lady hatfield cast upon the young nobleman a look expressive of so much mental suffering that he was deeply touched profoundly affected and yet he knew not how to administer consolation georgiana he at length said in as calm and collected a tone as he could assume though his heart was in reality rent by the most painful emotions there is some terrible mystery in all this i begin to believe as you yourself ere now endeavour to persuade me that your reason is in no way affected that you are not subject to mere whims and caprices no the cause of your grief your anguish your horror at the reminiscence of that event in hampshire an anguish and a horror cruelly revived last night by the presence of that rainford who is doubtless identical with the black mask an anguish and a horror perpetuated too until now continued arthur more emphatically the cause of all this is far far more serious than i had at first imagined you say that you cannot become my wife and that you have laboured under a misapprehension you wish us to look upon each other as brother and sister and yet you do love me well enough to become my wife did not some terrible and fearfully mysterious obstacle stand in the way oh if you really love me then pity me and tell me this dreadful secret which weighs upon your mind unless indeed and he paused abruptly as an awful suspicion rushed into his brain georgiana only turned her head aside and sobbed convulsively unless indeed continued the earl 
after a few moments' silence, it would bring a blush to your cheek to enlighten me. And I cannot, cannot ask you to humiliate yourself in my presence. Arthur, I dare not become your wife, exclaimed Georgiana, suddenly falling to her knees before him. And if you demand the reason, as, after all that has passed between us, you have a right, I will confess. Georgiana, no more, cried the earl, hastening to raise her. Not for worlds would I bring a blush to your cheek. And then, in a different, more serious, and very mournful tone, he added, Henceforth we will be to each other as sister and brother. With these words he touched her hand lightly with his lips, and was about to hurry from the room, when, animated by a sudden thought, Georgiana held him back, saying in a hollow, thick tone of voice, Whatever suspicion you now entertain, you do not believe that I was guilty, she added, as if the very words were choking her. No, much injured woman, cried the young nobleman warmly. A light has broken in upon my mind, and I understand it all. Yes, for a pure soul dwells in a tainted body, murmured Lady Hatfield. And if I have said this much, and you can well believe how painful to my feelings the mere necessity of making such an assertion must be, but in making it, I am influenced only by the hope, the earnest hope, of removing from your mind the mind of one whom I so much respect, so highly esteem. Say no more, my dearest sister, interrupted the earl emphatically, for as a sister do I now look upon you, and as a brother, he added sternly, will I avenge you. For that was I ere now hurrying away so abruptly. Avenge me, repeated Georgiana, looking wildly on the young nobleman's countenance which wore a calm but determined expression yes georgiana replied the earl wrongs so deep as yours demand a deadly vengeance and who so fit to become the instrument of that vengeance than he whom those wrongs which you have sustained so cruelly redound upon but for that incarnate fiend rainford would you not already yes already have been my loved and loving wife am i not then also wronged by him have i not something to avenge he demanded bitterly and to consummate this vengeance georgiana i your brother henceforth will forget my proud title cast aside the remembrance of my elevated rank and dressed in mean attire i will visit the noisome dens the foul courts the low neighbourhoods of london until I discover that miscreant Rainford. Then will I, still forgetting the proud title and the elevated rank, dare him to meet me in a duel from which at least but one shall depart alive, and wherein both may happily fall. I will not yield him up to the hangman, Georgiana, continued the earl, fearfully excited, because in his last moments he might confess his crimes, and include amongst them the foul wrong he has inflicted on thee, my sister. But I will descend to make myself his equal. I will place myself on a level with that black-hearted ruffian. Hold! Hold! screamed Georgiana, suddenly recovering the powers of utterance which had been paralysed by this tremendous explosion of generous indignation on the part of that proudly-born noble who proclaimed himself her champion. Hold! Hold, Arthur! You know not whom you calumniate whom you would provoke to the duel of death yes too well i know the miscreant cried the earl furiously no no you know him not screamed georgiana wildly this is childish silly said the earl impatiently was it not rainford who yes yes but this rainford is a fiend with a heart so black hold hold again i say ejaculated lady hatfield clasping her hands in despair that Thomas Rainford, whom you would make the victim of your vengeance, is— Is what? demanded the Earl hastily. Is— Is— Who in the name of heaven? Your brother, was the hysterical reply. End of section 47 Recording by Gray Clayton
Section forty eight of the Mysteries of London, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume three by George W. M. Reynolds. Farther explanations. My brother repeated the Earl of Ellingham with a wild glance and a sudden start indicative of the most painful surprise my brother georgiana oh no impossible tis true that my father but no that child died i can give you no particulars offer you no evidence in this most strange and mysterious matter said lady hatfield endeavouring to subdue the excitement produced in her much agitated mind by the preceding scene all i know is all that he told me was that secret which i have now revealed to you thus arthur you perceive that independent of the other reason which would prevent me from becoming yours and you from receiving me as your wife but wherefore did you not mention this at first at the commencement of our conversation this morning demanded the nobleman utterly bewildered by the revelation that had been made to him and scarcely knowing whether to regard it as a substantial fact or a miserable fiction because rainford himself appeared to tell it to me as a profound secret observed georgiana not that he desired me to consider it as such but his manner and then the nature of the revelation itself which could not be gratifying to your feelings oh i scarcely know what i am saying arthur but i would have spared your feelings had you not compelled me to make that revelation to prevent the mad the insane designs of vengeance which you had formed i understand you georgiana interrupted the earl and deeply oh deeply do i feel your generous consideration on that point but there is one question that i wish to ask you a question speak arthur this is the day of mutual outpourings of confidence said lady hatfield and remember we are henceforth to stand in the light of brother and sister to each other the question i would ask is relative to the robbery that was perpetrated on you and miss mordaunt a short time back near hounslow continued the earl was that highwayman he was he was exclaimed georgiana once more painfully excited but do not look coldly on me arthur do not despise me for that dreadful crime of perjury which i committed to save him he wrote me an imperious note commanding me to stop all proceedings instituted in reference to that matter what did such a note imply it was a menace a dreadful menace a threat to expose me if i did not obey his mandate consider arthur oh consider how i was placed my reputation at stake my fame in the hands of one who can you wonder that i preferred the dreadful alternative of perjury to the danger of disgrace and infamy which seemed to impend over my head alas i cannot blame you poor suffering woman ejaculated the earl in a tone of deep commiseration we never know how we should act till we find ourselves placed in circumstances of difficulty and embarrassment and then then even the most rigid integrity often yields but let us sit down quietly georgiana for a short half-hour compose ourselves if we can collect our scattered thoughts and converse together as sister and brother for i will now communicate to you the little i know concerning the birth of thomas rainford if he indeed be the offspring of that amour arthur ceased and passed his hand over his brow as if to calm the warfare of thoughts and conjectures which agitated his brain georgiana seated herself on the sofa and the earl at length took a chair near her then he continued in the following manner my father the late earl was married twice his first matrimonial connection was formed when he was thirty and this union was unproductive of issue lady ellingham as i have heard was a woman devotedly attached to the dissipation of a fashionable life she seemed to exist only to shine in the gay assemblies of the west end and as she had no children and her husband was immersed in politics she possessed no ties to bind her to her own fireside 
she played deeply for play was very fashionable then amongst ladies and is even now to a considerable extent her extravagances were great and she made rapid inroads upon my father's fortune by the time he was forty he found himself involved in debts and moreover rumour began to be so busy with the name of his wife imputing to her the most shameless infidelity that he determined to separate from her i should not allude to this circumstance i would not for a moment revive statements prejudicial to the memory of a woman who has long ago gone to render an account of her deeds to her maker were it not that respect for the name of my lamented father renders me anxious to discover any extenuation which offers itself for his subsequent conduct well a separation was resolved upon a certain income was settled upon lady ellingham the estate was put to nurse as the law phrase has it and my father who was a proud man retired to a small property which he possessed in ireland ostensibly for the purpose of giving up the cares of public life but in reality to conceal the necessity of retrenching his expenditure ten years passed away and when my father was upwards of fifty he returned to london his estates having in the meantime been relieved of all their encumbrances lady ellingham was still living but the smallness of her income and the impaired condition of her health forced her to dwell in the strictest retirement she had moreover become a devotee and manifested no desire to return into the dazzling scenes of fashionable life i am now speaking of about thirty-one years ago when i was not born it was at that period that my father encountered a young and very beautiful girl named octavia manners she was the half-sister of a marine store dealer who bore the disagreeable appellation of benjamin bones by all i have heard octavia must have been a charming creature and her manners acquirements and conversation were far superior to her humble condition in life i cannot give you any details respecting the way in which my father became acquainted with her suffice it to say that he grew deeply attached to her and his visits were encouraged by her brother but alas from all that i have heard i have grounds oh too strong grounds to believe that those visits were most unwelcome to octavia for she was beloved by a young man in her own sphere of life and whom she loved in return and it is now that i would palliate as far as possible the conduct of my sire while i am bound to admit that his proceedings in respect to that unhappy girl were most unworthy the noble and the man my heart aches too as i utter these words but i am telling you a history the truth of which must not be disguised nor in any way misrepresented but some allowance some little excuse may be found for a man who was separated from a wife whom he had not seen for many years and to whom there were positively no moral ties although the legal ones still existed to bind his fidelity he was devotedly attached to a young and beautiful girl who unfortunately could not return his love and who did not even seem flattered by his visits as so many maidens in her sphere would have been no she shrank from his addresses and implored him not to persecute her but he persisted in his visits and the first sad result was that the young man to whom octavia's faith was plighted would not believe that she discouraged the attentions of the nobleman who condescended to appear at that humble dwelling i cannot of course inform you although we may both imagine how the young man reproached octavia and how she defended herself but it is certain that he suddenly quitted the neighbourhood leaving behind him a note declaring that he should never see the unhappy girl again alas that i should now be compelled to recite the tale of my father's guilt my father's crime his love for octavia knew no bounds he was determined to risk all everything spare your feelings arthur dear arthur exclaimed lady hatfield for i can fully appreciate the grief which this revival of such a subject may cause you octavia then was purchased purchased with gold my father's gold georgiana and the deed of dare i call it aught save infamy was consummated 
said the earl in a low and subdued tone as if he were overcome by the enormity of his sire's guilt that guilt which with the venial filial affection he had vainly endeavoured to palliate yes twas done he continued sadly and the vile half-brother sold the honour of that young and already too deeply afflicted girl too deeply afflicted i say because she had lost him on whom the affections of her youthful heart were set the very day after her disgrace her ruin she fled from her brother's house and for several months no trace was discovered of her it was feared she had committed suicide and my father was almost distracted at that precise period his wife died having ended as a devotee that life of which so much of the early portion was passed in dissipation and illicit amours she had not been laid many weeks in the family vault when my father by some means unknown to me perhaps by accident discovered that octavia was living and that she was in the way to become a mother he hastened to the miserable garret which she occupied and found her in the most abject state of poverty endeavouring to earn a subsistence with her needle a girl of the gipsy tribe and whose name was miranda was the friend and companion of poor octavia how they grew acquainted how they came to live together i am not aware but miranda was much attached to poor octavia and was nearly her own age indeed octavia was not seventeen even at that time and this miranda of whom i speak was about fifteen much mystery envelops this portion of the sad tale it is however certain that my father visited octavia for several days that he passed hours with her that she even appeared to be reconciled to his presence and that they went out together and remained absent for hours on two or three occasions again she disappeared suddenly abruptly without having intimated her intention to my father and without even having confided her design to her friend miranda for miranda remained behind at the lodging and when my father called and found octavia not he was seized with a paroxysm of the deepest grief another year passed away and behold poverty and distress drove the unfortunate octavia to seek an asylum at the house of her half-brother she would not doubtless have gone near that fatal dwelling where her ruin was accomplished had it not been for the child which she held in her arms that child a boy was the fruit of her connection with my father or rather of the dreadful deed which gave her when under the influence of an opiate into his arms but she was dying yes she was dying when she knocked at her brother's door and on her deathbed she implored that my father might be sent for he flew to her he knelt by her side he took the child in his arms and embraced both the dying mother and the innocent babe by a strange a wondrous coincidence miranda entered the house at that moment she had come to make inquiries concerning octavia and found her dying the poor mother forgave those who had wronged her forgave her half-brother blessed my father yes blessed him and recommended her infant to his care that infant being also his own then my father requested to be left alone with her but scarcely had the villain bones and the unfaithful miranda quitted the room when they were recalled by a dreadful cry which burst from my father's lips and they hurried back to find that octavia was no more arthur paused to wipe away the tears which were trickling down his cheeks nor were georgiana's eyes unmoistened by the sweet dews of sympathy when my father had sufficiently recovered himself to attend to more worldly matters continued the young earl he gave directions for the funeral of his victim and to miranda did he entrust the child then he placed in the hands of benjamin bones in the presence of miranda a thousand guineas to be placed out at interest in order to provide the means of supporting the infant and his nurse i should also inform you that a small roll of papers carefully wrapped up in a piece of thick brown paper was found upon the person of octavia shortly after her death and these were taken possession of by benjamin bones my father having previously quitted the house of the nature of those documents i know nothing but i have been informed that when the half-brother read them he was greatly excited and secured them under lock and key 
a year elapsed during which my father called several times to see the little boy who throve well in miranda's care but at the expiration of that period his visits ceased altogether for he was about to marry again twenty-nine years ago the honourable miss stamford became his second wife and twenty-six years ago i was born but before the date of my birth and within six months after the marriage of my father appeared in the newspapers bones discharged miranda on some pretence and she returned to her tribe some few months afterwards she fell in with another tribe and to her profound surprise she discovered the child thomas in the possession of a woman named egyptia of the child's identity miranda had no doubt because it had a peculiar mark near the shoulder of the right arm she and her sister gypsy then compared notes and Egyptia told her that she had received the child from a man named benjamin bones a marine store dealer in greville street hatton garden that bones had given her twenty guineas to take the child that the money was all gone and that she already repented of the bargain miranda who was attached to the child offered to take it and her proposal was accepted for seven years did the faithful miranda rear the boy as if he were her own but at last she fell dangerously ill was long delirious and when she awoke to consciousness again she learned from her companion that the boy had died of the same epidemic malady beneath which she herself had nearly succumbed again the earl paused for a few moments and when he again broke silence it was to conclude his narrative my father as you are aware georgiana died when i was only a year old and i was brought up by my mother at the age of nineteen i went to oxford and it was in the neighbourhood of that city i one day fell in with a party of gipsies they offered to tell my fortune and i consented for the amusement of the farce the young female who undertook the task commenced by giving me my real name for i had doubtless been pointed out to her in the city as the gipsies had been there and in the vicinity for several days but the moment my name was mentioned another gipsy woman who had probably seen forty summers uttered an ejaculation of surprise looked hard at me and then inquired abruptly whether i was the son of the late earl of ellingham i answered in the affirmative and she let drop some observations which excited my curiosity i took her aside thrust a guinea into her hand and demanded of her the meaning of her words she returned me the money and after much persuasion narrated to me the whole history of octavia manners that is to say as much of it as i have now told to you you now understand georgiana how it is possible that this thomas rainford may be my half-brother but if he be the account of his death received by miranda from her companions must have been false for i need hardly tell you that the elderly gipsy who unfolded to me the details of my father's fatal conduct towards poor octavia was none other than miranda herself shortly afterwards my mother died but i never revealed to her the story of her late husband's guilt and octavia's wrongs scarcely was this strange narrative concluded when the door of the apartment opened and sir ralph walsingham entered the room well he exclaimed mr rainford who honoured this house with a visit last night and frightened you georgiana so sadly has got himself into a pleasant scrape at last indeed exclaimed lord ellingham hastily what he is arrested on a charge of highway robbery a robbery in fact committed on no less a person than our acquaintance sir christopher blunt returned the baronet arrested ejaculated the earl exchanging a rapid glance with georgiana as much as to enjoin her not to allow the subject of their previous conversation to transpire in the presence of sir ralph walsingham yes arrested last night lodged in horsemonger lane jail as a character too desperate to put into the usual lock-up and examined before the magistrates at the office in the borough this morning continued sir ralph i happened to be in the neighbourhood an hour ago and heard all about it but he is remanded for a week at the solicitation of mr howard the attorney for the prosecution sir christopher not being in london well poor fellow i am really sorry for him for he seems to be a dashing daring gallant blade by all accounts 
"'Pardon me, however, my dear Georgiana,' he added, seeing that his niece was deadly pale. "'I ought not to have spoken a word in favour of a man who terrified you so. "'But—' Lord Ellingham interrupted Sir Ralph by taking his leave of him and Georgiana, and as the nobleman took the latter by the hand, he said in a hasty whisper, "'I will go and see him at once.' He then left the house, entered a hackney-coach at the nearest stand, and ordered the driver to take him to Horsemonger Lane Jail. End of section 48section forty nine of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section forty nine lord ellingham and tom rain the interview between Lady Hatfield and the Earl of Ellingham had lasted a considerable time, and it was close upon three o'clock in the afternoon when his lordship reached Horsemonger Lane Jail. He communicated to the governor his desire to see Thomas Rainford, and although visitors were usually compelled to speak to prisoners through an iron grating, yet the rank of the nobleman and the fact of his being in the commission of the peace for another county, Middlesex, procured him immediate access to the highwayman's cell. Rainford was sitting in a pensive attitude at a table on which his dinner remained untouched. We have before said, and we now repeat, that he cared but little for the peril of his own predicament. There were, however, ties which bound him to the existence that was now in jeopardy and to the freedom that was lost. He started from his seat with unfeigned surprise when the Earl of Ellingham entered the cell. "'You are astonished to see me here, Mr. Rainford?' said the nobleman in a mild and mournful tone. "'It is a visit, my lord,' was the answer, "'that I certainly did not expect. "'And yet, if the statement you made to Lady Hatfield be true, "'I am but performing a duty.' "'Ah, then she has told you that!' exclaimed the prisoner." "'She has told me that you claim a near, a very near relationship to me,' rejoined the nobleman, his voice trembling with emotion, for the reader has seen enough of him to be aware that he possessed a generous heart. "'Yes, my lord,' replied Rainford. "'The same father was the author of our being, although our mothers were different.' "'Is this true? Is it really true?' demanded the earl hastily. As true as there is an almighty God who now beholds the great peer and the prisoned highwayman face to face, replied Rainford solemnly, and divesting himself of his coat, he bared his right arm and exhibited a particular mark. I cannot doubt it. I cannot disbelieve you, exclaimed the nobleman, tears starting from his eyes. And then the great peer and the prisoned highwayman were folded in each other's arms, "'But, my God!' exclaimed Arthur, when the excitement of this fraternal recognition had somewhat passed away. "'In what a condition do I find you, my poor brother?' "'Grieve not for me, Arthur,' said Rainford. "'My fate will soon be decided now, and whatever it may be, I shall be prepared to meet it as becomes a brave man.' "'Talk not thus, Thomas,' cried the nobleman, pressing his hand warmly. "'I have money to buy off your prosecutors.' interest to use in your behalf. If I say to you, yes, use both, Arthur replied the highwayman, it is only because there is one who loves me well, and for whose sake I could wish to live. I understand you. You allude to Miss Esther de Medina, said the earl, but there is another for whose sake you must hope to live and enjoy freedom again, and that is the brother who now stands before you, and who, for our father's sake, will never, never desert you. My dear Arthur, your kindness unmans me, said Rainford. And yet, if you knew all, you would perhaps think that I am not altogether unworthy of your sympathy. But sit down and let me show you that, though of lost and ruined reputation, I am not without some feeling. The earl took one of the two chairs that there were in the cell, and Rainford seated himself near his half-brother on the other. 
that you are acquainted with a considerable portion of my history I know, resumed the highwayman. For some seven or eight years ago, you encountered a gypsy woman near Oxford who revealed to you. The faithful Miranda indeed told me all she knew, interrupted the earl. But at that period, she believed you to have been long dead. Yes, and it was only a short time ago that I met her in Hampshire, answered Rainford, and accident led us to converse together. A word or two which I dropped without anticipating the result induced her to make certain inquiries. Then she requested me, in a hurried and excited manner, to bear my right arm, and it was only on the occasion of which I am speaking, and which occurred a few months since, that I learnt the real narrative of my birth. It appears that when Miranda had fallen so dangerously ill and had become delirious, the gypsies considered me to be a burden to them, as I was not born of their race and one of them took me to Winchester, in the neighborhood of which city the tents were pitched at the time, and there he purposely abandoned me. What subsequently became of me I have not time now to relate. My history has been most eventful, and could not be compressed into a short narrative. But should the laws of my country demand that my misdeeds be expiated on the scaffold, I will leave that history written out in all its remarkable details for your contemplation. Talk not thus, Thomas. Oh, talk not thus, cried Arthur. I will save you yet, even if I throw myself at the feet of the sovereign and proclaim that you are my brother. God grant that you may prove successful for the sake of one who loves me well, said Rainford solemnly. But let me pursue the thread of that much of my story which I have now to relate to you. It appears that when Miranda did recover from her serious illness, the gypsies did not like to tell her the truth relative to myself, and they therefore invented the tale of my death to account for my disappearance. Thus was it that, until a few months ago, she remained in ignorance of the deceit that had been practiced upon her, and the same day which revealed to her the fact that I was still alive made me acquainted with the history of my birth. Miranda also told me that Benjamin Bones was still in existence and was reputed to be a rich man. She had recently been in London, and curiosity had prompted her to make inquiries concerning him. All that she had gleaned she communicated to me. It then struck me that I would come to London, that I would throw myself in the way of that man who had plundered me of my inheritance and that I would watch for some favorable opportunity to wring from him the amount with interest and compound interest that was fairly mine. I learned from Miranda that certain papers had been found about the person of my poor mother after she was dead, and that the perusal of them had excited the interest of this bones. It therefore struck me that I might recover those documents, as well as the money of which I had been plundered. If the documents should prove in any way interesting or valuable, I thought, so much the better. If not, no harm would be done in obtaining possession of them. I came to London, and accident enabled me, through the intervention of a mutual acquaintance named Tullock, to meet with Benjamin Bones. I offered him my services in a particular way, and he accepted them. To be candid, he was to plan deeds of villainy, and I was to execute them. His terms were so ridiculously exorbitant that I should have laughed at them had I not a particular object to serve in connecting myself with him. And the opportunity which I sought presented itself sooner than I had anticipated. In a word, I had succeeded in all I had undertaken. I was enabled to help myself to as much as I chose of his hoarded treasures, and I discovered the papers that I have alluded to. And were they of any interest? asked the Earl. Of such interest and of such value, Arthur, returned Tom Rain, that perhaps there is no other man in England who would have failed to avail himself of the brilliant prospects that they opened to my view. But I was not to be dazzled by them, not to be led away by the temptation. No, I knew that my character was gone, that my reputation was tarnished, that my misdeeds were numerous and great, 
and I felt also for you, Arthur, as well as for the haughty name of Ellingham. "'What do you mean, my dear brother?' cried the noble, struck by the impressive tone in which Rainford uttered these words. "'I mean,' answered the debased highwayman to the great peer, "'that within the last few days there has been within my reach a jewel which I might have had, and might have still, for the mere trouble of extending my hand to reach it, a jewel such as men toil all their lives to gain. This jewel is a proud title and a princely fortune. Thomas, my brother, ejaculated the earl, a strange and exciting suspicion flashing through his brain. Yes, a proud title and a princely fortune, Arthur, repeated Rainford, but I desire neither. Yet, solemnly and seriously, do I declare that amongst those papers which I discovered in the den of Benjamin Bones, there was one which would make me rich at the expense of another, ennoble me to the prejudice of one whom the proud title better becomes, and that individual who would thus suffer is yourself. For Octavia Manners was the Countess of Ellingham, and I, the debased highwayman, am thine elder brother, legitimately born. Oh, what do I hear? exclaimed Arthur. And how much generosity does your conduct display? But think not, dearest brother, that I grieve at the announcement which you have just made. No, far from that. To know that my father did justice to your poor mother, to be able to entertain the conviction that the author of our being was less guilty than I imagined, is a source of satisfaction so pure, so sincere, so heartfelt, that I would gladly purchase it even with the loss of title and fortune. It is you who are generous, Arthur, said Rainford, for so we shall continue to call him at all events for the present. But that coronet which sits so gracefully on your noble brow, and that fortune which enables you to do so much good, shall never be lost to you. No, never, Arthur. Titles I care not for, great wealth I do not crave. And even if I yearned for the one or aspire to the other, of what avail would be that idol? Ineffectual ambition? Here am I in a vile dungeon, accused of a serious offense, my life endangered. And even if your interest should save me, must I not forever become an exile from the land of my birth? Yes. For whether you deter the prosecutors from farther proceedings in my case, or... Should they push the matter to the extreme verge and my life be saved only at your intercession, can I remain in England? If released from custody, how can I hope to gain an honest name in this clime? If condemned to death and then reprieved, will not this leniency on the part of the Crown be conceded on the condition of banishment for the remainder of my days? Thus, Arthur, even did I desire to possess the proud name of Ellingham, did I aspire to that coronet which adorns thy brow, I could not be mad enough to yield to the temptation. But, I repeat, I care not for rank, I need not much wealth, and thus neither my position nor my inclination will for an instant permit me to disturb you in the enjoyment of the family honors and the hereditary estates. Alas, how much, how deeply do I regret that we had not met before to embrace his brothers, exclaimed the earl, though crimes are imputed to you, Thomas. Yet do you possess a heart endowed with the loftiest, the most generous feelings. Ah, well do I now understand wherefore you were agitated last night at Lady Hatfield's house, and why you told me that from no other man in England would you ask as a favor that right of egress from the mansion which you could command by force, and I, who was once on the point of striking you. But wherefore did you not then reveal to me what you have told me now? The secret of my birth you should never have learned from my lips, answered Rainford. No, I would not have allowed you to know that you possessed a relative for whom you would have to blush. But I was compelled to make that revelation to Lady Hatfield, because, ah, oh, 
Let us not talk of her, brother, said Lord Ellingham mournfully. I would not for worlds reproach you. And yet you know not how profoundly I have loved that woman, how tenderly I love her still. But my hopes there... Let us change the topic, I say, he added, hastily interrupting himself. And now tell me if there be anything I can do in order to soften the grief which must be experienced by that one to whom you alluded ere now, any message that I can take to her. Yes, you must see her, said Rainford, after a moment's reflection, and you must tell her that she is to give up to you all those papers which relate to the marriage of our father and my mother and to my birth. She is acquainted with everything that concerns me and my affairs. It was my original intention to keep those papers not to serve any purpose, never to use them, but to gratify one of those unaccountable whims which sometimes influence the most strong-minded amongst us. I thought that perhaps, when in a foreign land, for it was my intention to have quitted this country in a few days, I might sometimes feel a pleasure in contemplating documents so closely connected with my parentage and my birth. Perhaps, too, I might have been swayed by some little sentiment of pride in being able to say to myself, a title and a princely fortune are within my grasp, and I will not take them because I feel myself so utterly unworthy of the first, and because I require not the other. But now, let my fate be whatever it may, it is prudent that those papers should be destroyed. She who has them in her keeping loves me, adores me, but she has one foible, one weakness, which has already produced serious embarrassment. She is fond of gay apparel, of costly jewels, of those trinkets and that outward show which dazzled the minds of so many women, and this passion on her part is stronger than herself. In a word, then, I would rather that the paper should not remain in her hands. I would sooner that they should be burnt at once than become the source of a temptation which circumstances might perhaps some day render irresistible to her. If you really wish to ease my mind of any portion of that weight of anxiety which now hangs upon it, you will at once visit her and when you tell her all that has passed between you and me ere now, she will give you up those documents, which I enjoin you to commit to the flames when you have perused them. I will do your bidding, Thomas, in all respects save one, returned Lord Ellingham, and that is with regard to the destruction of the papers. No, if you are generous to a degree, I must at least be just, and I will keep those documents for you, safely, religiously keep them, to be at your disposal at any time, however remote, should altered circumstances induce you to claim them. Then you imagine, said Rainford, with something of bitterness in his tone, that should the future smile upon me, I might be tempted to pluck the coronet from your brow and place it on mine own. You wrong me. Yes, you wrong me, Arthur. "'Heaven knows that I would not willingly, wantonly do so,' cried the nobleman enthusiastically. "'But justice—' "'Well, be it as you say,' interrupted Rainford, with a view to terminate the discussion on this topic. "'Obtain the papers. They will be safer with you than with her, much as she is devoted to me. And now must I reveal to you another secret, a secret of a strange and romantic nature— "'connected with her whom you are about to visit.' "'With Esther?' said the Earl hastily. "'Ah, ever harping upon that name,' exclaimed Rainford. "'Did I not assure you last night that Esther is as pure and innocent as woman can be, "'and that she does not even know me by sight? "'See then if I have deceived you, but I will not keep you in suspense.' "'At this moment,' The turnkey entered with an intimation that it was impossible to allow the interview to be protracted any longer on the present occasion, as the hour for locking up had already passed some time. "'Tomorrow, then, you will come again,' said Renford, in a low whisper to his brother. "'And now go to 
No. 5 Brandon Street, Locks Fields. It's not very far from here. And inquire for Mrs. Rainford. The Earl pressed his hand in assurance of obeying the directions thus given. And as the turnkey appeared impatient, the young nobleman hurried away from his brother's cell. But the mystery relative to Esther de Medina, whatever it might be, was not so soon to be cleared up as the Earl of Ellingham expected. Upon leaving the prison, he observed an ill-looking fellow lounging about at the gate, and on whose forbidding countenance the light of the lamp streamed fully when the wicket was opened to afford the nobleman egress for our readers will remember that all the incidents yet related in this narrative occurred in the winter time, when it is dark at four o'clock. But it was now nearly six o'clock, and the atmosphere was heavy with mist. The Earl walked rapidly away from the prison gate, and when he had proceeded about thirty yards, he inquired of a passer-by the way to Locke's fields. The man was a stranger in the neighborhood, and could not tell him. "'Please, sir, I'll show you the way,' exclaimed another individual, stepping officiously forward. Lord Ellingham immediately recognized, by the light that glimmered from a window in Horsemonger Lane, the ill-looking fellow whom he had noticed at the door of the prison, and for an instant he hesitated to accept his services. But at the next moment, he felt ashamed of this vague alarm, and directed the man to lead on. The fellow turned abruptly round, saying, "'You are going out of your way, sir. We must get down to the fields by the back of the prison.' And he led the way, the Earl following him, down Horsemonger Lane towards Harper Street. But as they passed along the prison wall, Arthur observed two or three men loitering about at short intervals from each other and it struck him that his guide coughed in a peculiar fashion as he passed them. A misgiving, which he vainly endeavored to resist, was now excited in the Earl's mind, but still he would not turn back nor question his guide. Suddenly he was seized from behind and pulled violently backward, while a strong hand fastened itself, as it were, over his mouth. He struggled desperately, but his guide turned on him, and he was now in the grasp of four powerful men, whose united strength it was impossible to resist. Still, he endeavored to release himself, and once he managed to get the hand away from his mouth, an advantage of which he instantly availed himself to cry out for help. But in another instant he was stunned by the blow of a pistol on the head. When he awoke, he was in total darkness and lying on a hard bed. He instinctively stretched out his arms. His right hand encountered a rough and damp stone wall. He rose and groped cautiously about him. But it required not many moments to convince him of the terrible though mysterious truth that he was the inmate of a narrow dungeon. But where was he thus imprisoned? Who were the authors of this outrage? And for what purpose was he made a captive? These three queries defied all conjecture, and the young nobleman was left to the darkness of his dungeon and the gloom of his meditations. End of section 49. Recorded by Sheila Blunt. Section 50 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. A Painful Interview We must now go back a few hours, only to the morning of this eventful day, in order to describe the interview which Mr. Clarence Villiers had with his respectable aunt, Mrs. Slingsby, at her residence in Old Burlington Street. He called at her abode as early as nine o'clock, for he had passed a sleepless night, in consequence of the communication made to him by the individual whom he has as yet knew only as Captain Sparks, and of whose arrest in the preceding night he was as yet ignorant. Mrs. Slingsby, Adelaide, 
and rosamond were seated at breakfast in a comfortable little parlour when clarence was announced at first his appearance at so unusual an hour and when he was supposed to be on his way to his office in somerset house excited some alarm lest he had bad news to communicate and the sisters already trembled for fear their father had discovered their abode but he speedily reassured them by declaring that he intended to give himself a holiday that morning and had therefore come to join them at the breakfast-table you are welcome clarence said mrs slingsby while adelaide appeared so pleased at this unexpected visit that the enhanced carnation tinge of her cheeks and the joy that flushed in her fine eyes rendered her transcendently beautiful but rosamond seemed pensive and even melancholy although she endeavoured to smile and appear gay i had a visit from captain sparks last evening observed clarence he is going to america and he called to take leave of me as well as to entrust me with some little commission which i of course undertook and we heard a most wholesome and beneficial discourse from the reverend mr sawkins observed mrs slingsby was mr sheepshanks present asked villiers without looking at his aunt and apparently intent only on carving the ham my dear clarence said mrs slingsby in a serious reproachful tone your question is light and inconsiderate you doubtless intended it as a jest but the object to which it refers is one painfully calculated to wound those who have the good cause at heart mr sheepshanks has conducted himself in a manner that has produced the most lively grief as well as the greatest astonishment in what may be strictly termed the religious world sir henry courtenay was shocked when i narrated the incident to him oh sir henry was shocked was he exclaimed clarence well for my part i should have conceived that a man of fashion would have cared very little for all the sheep shankses and sawkinses in the universe clarence said mrs slingsby what is the matter with you this morning there seems to be an unusual flippancy in your observations not at all my dear aunt only i conceive that a man who is fond of gaiety who goes to parties mixes with the elite of the west end and so on can have but little time to devote to the interests of cannibal clothing associations dear nephew you astonish me exclaimed mrs slingsby is it to affix a vulgar nickname to an admirable institution that you call it a cannibal clothing association i once thought you had some degree of respect for the philanthropic and religious establishments which are the boast and ornament of your native land but my dear aunt pardon me if i have offended you said clarence but in a cool and indifferent tone i really forgot at the moment the name of the institution to which that arrant hypocrite and scoundrel sheepshanks belonged use not such harsh words clarence enjoined mrs slingsby who knew not what to think of her nephew's unusual manner and discourse mr sheepshanks has lost himself in the estimation of all persons of rightly constituted minds but the christian spirit of forgiveness commands us to be lenient in our comments on the actions even of the wicked that may be said clarence but as i read the account in the newspapers it certainly looked so black against this sheepshanks that had he been sent to newgate he would have had no more than his due now my opinion is this robbery is always a heinous crime but he who robs his fellow-creatures under the cloak of religion is an atrocious sinner indeed hypocrisy my dear aunt is a detestable vice and you as a woman of sound sense and discerning judgment must admit the truth of my observation but we were talking of sir henry courtenay you must not utter a word against him said adelaide in the most artless manner possible for rosamond has conceived so high an opinion of him because dear mrs slingsby has represented his virtues his mental qualifications his admirable character to me in terms which make me as enthusiastic as herself in extolling so good and amiable a man exclaimed rosamond speaking with an ardour which was the more striking because the natural purity of her soul prevented her from seeing the necessity of checking it mrs slingsby coloured and glanced uneasily towards her nephew who did not however appear to notice that the conversation had taken a turn which was disagreeable to her in fact the suspicions originally excited in his mind by the communications of the preceding evening were now materially strengthened 
and the more he contemplated the character of his aunt, the more transparent became the film that had so long blinded him as to its real nature. "'And so you are a great admirer of Sir Henry Courtenay, Rosamond?' he said, endeavouring to maintain as calm and placid an exterior as possible. "'Rosamond is fully aware that virtue deserves respect, wherever it exists,' returned Mrs. Slingsby hastily. "'And Sir Henry Courtenay is the pattern of all virtue, dear madam, is he not?' exclaimed Rosamond. "'He is a very good man, my dear, as I have frequently assured you,' said the pious widow. "'But let us change a conversation which does not appear agreeable to Clarence.' "'I would not for the world manifest so much selfishness,' observed Villiers coolly, "'as to quit a topic which gives so much gratification to Rosamond. "'At the same time, as the future husband of Adelais, "'and therefore soon to be your brother-in-law, dear Rosamond, "'I must warn you against conceiving extravagant notions "'of the integrity and immaculate virtue of any man "'who belongs to what is called the fashionable world.' "'Dear Mrs. Slingsby has assured me, Clarence,' ejaculated Rosamond warmly, "'that Sir Henry Courtenay is an exception to the general rule, "'that he is the very pattern of everything generous and good, "'and that no one could err in following his advice, whatever it might be. "'Oh, I can assure you!' "'Rosamond stopped short, for Mrs. Slingsby, "'seeing that her nephew's countenance was becoming purple with indignation, as the artless girl thus gave vent to the enthusiasm excited in her soul by the most insidious representations. Mrs. Slingsby, we say, had touched her with her foot beneath the table, a movement naturally construed by Rosamond into a hint to cut short her observations. "'You can retire, dear girls,' said Mrs. Slingsby. "'I wish to have a little conversation with Clarence.' "'Do not keep us away long, dear madam,' exclaimed Adelaide, in a playful manner as she rose to quit the room with her sister. Clarence and Mrs. Slingsby were now alone together, and the position of each was a most painful one. The aunt saw that something was wrong, and her guilty conscience excited a thousand vague fears within her bosom, while the nephew felt convinced that the relative, whom he had hitherto loved and respected, was worthy only of his abhorrence and contempt. There was a long pause in the conversation after the sisters had left the room, but at length the silence so irksome to both nephew and aunt was broken by the latter. "'Clarence, something appears to have vexed, to have annoyed you this morning,' she observed in a tremulous tone. "'Do you know,' he said, turning abruptly round towards her, and fixing a searching glance upon her countenance, "'that you act most unwisely.' most indiscreetly nay most incorrectly to expatiate so much upon the virtues of sir henry courtenay when i first entered the room this morning i found rosamond pensive and thoughtful and she said not a word until that man's name was mentioned when she became as it were enthusiastic in his defence although no actual attack was made by me upon his character what is the meaning of this strange conduct clarence if in my respect for sir henry courtenay i have been too warm in my praises of his character if aunt there is no supposition in the case interrupted villiers almost sternly you have been too warm and heaven only knows with what object god forbid that i should impute the worst motives to your conduct in this respect but a dreadful suspicion has been excited in my mind a suspicion murmured mrs slingsby faintly while the glance which she threw upon her nephew was full of uneasiness yes a suspicion he repeated and most painful oh most painful is it to me to be compelled to address you in this manner but the case is too serious to allow me to remain silent in one word have you not made an impression on the mind of that artless girl which may endanger her peace have you not been encouraging in her breast an admiration for a man old enough to be her grandfather an admiration which is not natural and which is calculated to inspire her with feelings towards a sexagenarian dandy clarence exclaimed the pious lady in a hysterical manner how dare you address me in this dictatorial tone would you seek to invest my conduct in bestowing well-merited praise on a good man with an aspect so black your indignation is well feigned cried villiers his lips quivering with rage but the day of deception has passed 
hypocrisy shall no longer impose upon me if i accuse you unjustly i will grovel as an abject wretch at your feet to manifest my contrition before i thus debase myself however you must prove to me that you are indeed the noble-minded the open-hearted the immaculate woman i have so long loved and revered tell me then the real the true history of that night when a boy was received into this house through charity a few years ago mrs slingsby became as pale as death and sat gazing with haggard eyes upon her nephew unable to avert her gaze and yet shrinking from his then you are guilty madam he said after a few moments pause and the excellent the virtuous the upright sir henry courtenay is your lover my god did the world ever know hypocrisy so abominable so black as this these words were uttered with extreme bitterness and mrs slingsby burst into a flood of tears while she covered her face with her hands clarence possessed a generous heart and this sight moved him my dear aunt he said i do not wish to mortify you much less to humiliate you in my presence in your own estimation you must necessarily be humiliated enough neither will i dwell at any length upon the pain the intense grief which i experience in finding you so different from what i have ever believed you to be until now he added in a mournful tone were you my sister or did you stand with reference to me in a degree of relationship that will permit me to remonstrate and advise i should perhaps both reproach and counsel you but it would ill become a nephew to address his aunt in such a manner clarence will you expose me will you ruin me demanded mrs slingsby in a hysterical tone not for the worlds would i injure you ejaculated the young man but i must receive no more favours at your hands here take back the money which you gave me a few days ago thank god i have not yet expended any of it and the arrangements i have made to furnish a house for the reception of my adelaide's can be countermanded she will not object to share a lodging with me until by my own honest exertions he added proudly i may be able to give her a suitable home and as he spoke he cast a roll of banknotes upon the table oh clarence if i have been weak frail culpable cried the widow you are at least severe and cruel for i have ever done all i could to serve your interests were i to express my real opinion on that head answered villiers i might grieve you still more than i have already done a bandage has fallen from my eyes and i can now understand how necessary an instrument of publicity i have been for your assumed virtues but in the name of god let us argue the point no further for sincerely sincerely do i assert my unwillingness to give you additional pain pardon me however if i declare how impossible it is how inconsistent it would be to leave those innocent girls in a dwelling which is visited by such a man as that sir henry courtenay how could you remove them elsewhere without exposing me clarence demanded his aunt in an imploring tone what explanation can you or i give them to account in reasonable manner for the suddenness of such a step villiers paced the room in an agitated manner he knew not how to act to leave adelaide's and rosamond in the society of his aunt was repugnant to his high sense of honour and his correct notions of propriety and whither to remove them he knew not he had seen and heard enough at the breakfast-table to convince him that mrs slingsby had some sinister motive in creating in the mind of rosamond that innocent artless mind which was so susceptible of any impressions which a designing woman might choose to make upon it a feeling of admiration in favour of the baronet and although he had to a considerable extent curbed the resentment and the indignation which his aunt's conduct in this respect had aroused within him still to leave that young maiden any longer within an atmosphere of infection was impossible no he would sooner restore the sisters to their father and leave to circumstances the realization of his hopes in regard to adelaide's while he was still deliberating within himself what course to pursue and while mrs slingsby was anxiously watching him as he paced the room with agitated steps the servant entered with the morning's newspaper clarence took it from the table in a mechanical manner and glanced his eye over the first page but his thoughts were too painfully preoccupied to permit him to entertain even for an instant 
any idea of reading the journal no it was one of those unwitting actions which we often perform when sorely embarrassed or bewildered an action without positive motive and without aim but how often do the most trivial deeds exercise a paramount influence over our destinies and this simple action of glancing at the newspaper proved to be an instance of the kind for the moment when clarence was about to throw the journal back again upon the table and resume his agitated walk his eyes encountered an advertisement which instantaneously arrested his attention then with beating heart and with an expression of joy rapidly spreading over his countenance he read the following lines to a and r your distressed and almost heart-broken father implores you to return to him the past shall be forgotten on his side and no obstacle shall be opposed to the happiness of a your father is lying on a sick-bed and again implores that this very prayer may not be made in vain god be thanked cried villiers no longer able to restrain his joy and handing the newspaper to his aunt he directed her attention to the advertisement here is an apology at once for the removal of the young ladies from the house clarence observed mrs slingsby and now that you are saved from the embarrassment in which you were plunged but a few minutes back will you promise never never to reveal and if possible to forget you allude to your conduct towards rosamond said villiers tell me its motive and i swear solemnly in one word then interrupted his aunt let rosamond be aware of sir henry courtenay and now answer me a single question for i see you are impatient to be gone how came you to discover what meant your allusion to to the boy who was received into this house i cannot stay to explain all that cried villiers but rest assured that your character stands no chance of being made the subject of scandalous talk unless indeed your future actions enough clarence exclaimed mrs slingsby i know that you must despise me but spare me any farther humiliation she then rang the bell and desired the servant to summon adelaide and rosamond we need not pause to describe the joy which those fair beings experienced when clarence showed them the advertisement inviting them to return home although tears immediately afterwards started into their eyes when they read that their father was upon a bed of sickness they once more retired to their bedchamber to prepare their toilette for departure and when a hackney coach drove round to the door they took leave of mrs slingsby with demonstrations of gratitude which struck to her heart like a remorse clarence accompanied them back to the cottage and his heart palpitated violently he scarcely knew wherefore when he assisted them to alight the front door was opened by the female servant who uttered a cry of joy on beholding the young ladies once more and with trembling steps adelaide and rosamond entered the parlour followed by clarence to their surprise and at first to their great delight the sisters found themselves on crossing the threshold of the room in the presence of their father who was looking pale it was true but with concentrated anger and not with illness adelaide and rosamond fell on their knees before him exclaiming forgive us dear father forgive us how am i to receive you adelaide he asked in a cold voice as miss torrance or as as miss torrance at present sir answered clarence stepping forward and speaking in a firm though respectful tone but in accordance with the promise held out in that advertisement which appears in to-day's journal i hope that your elder daughter will soon be mine and with your permission and blessing also where have my daughters been residing during their absence sir inquired mr torrens without appearing to notice the latter portion of villiers observations under the protection of a female relative of mine sir answered clarence with increasing misgivings at the cold demeanour of the father of his beloved thank you for the information sir said mr torrens with a smile of triumph at least you have so far disarmed my resentment that you have brought me back my daughter pure and innocent as when you enticed her away with the aid of a villainous robber a robber ejaculated clarence indignantly yes sir continued mr torrance in a sneering tone your worthy colleague captain sparks is a common highwayman a thief properly named thomas rainford and at this moment he is a prisoner in horsemonger lane jail scarcely ten minutes have elapsed since i received a note from mr howard a solicitor informing me of the fact 
Clarence was so astounded by this announcement that for a few moments he could make no reply, and the young ladies, who had in the meantime slowly risen from their suppliant posture, and were now standing timidly by their father's side, exchanged glances of painful surprise. Yes, resumed Mr. Torrance in a stern and severe tone, that man who aided you to effect the abduction of these disobedient girls is a common highwayman, and you could not be ignorant of that fact. As I live, sir, ejaculated Clarence, at length recovering the power of speech, I was ignorant of the fact, and even now. But, he added, correcting himself, I cannot doubt your word. At the same time, permit me to assure you that I had never seen him until that night. I require no farther explanation, sir, interrupted Mr. Torrance. My daughters are now once more under the paternal roof. Inveigled back again, it is true, by a stratagem on my part. A stratagem? repeated Clarence, while Adelaide uttered a faint shriek, and sank weeping into her sister's arms. Yes, a stratagem, sir, ejaculated Mr. Torrance. And now learn my decision, Mr. Villiers. Sooner than she shall become your wife, he continued, pointing towards the unhappy girl, I would give her to the meanest hind who toils for his daily bread. Depart, sir. This house is at least a place where my authority can alone prevail. "'Mr. Torrance, I beseech, I implore you,' began the wretched young man, whose hopes were thus suddenly menaced so cruelly. "'Depart, sir,' thundered the angry father, "'or I shall use violence, and we will then see whether you will strike in return the parent of her whom you affect to love.' And he advanced towards Villiers in a menacing manner. "'I will not stay to irritate you, sir,' said Clarence, feeling as if his heart were ready to burst. Adelais, remember one who will never cease to remember you. Rosamond, farewell. Mr. Torrens became more and more impatient, and Villiers quitted the house with feelings as different from those which had animated him when he entered it, as the deepest despair is from the most joyous hope. But the anguish of his heart was not greater than that which now filled the bosom of her from whom he was so unexpectedly and cruelly separated. End of section 50。section 51 of the mysteries of london volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the mysteries of london volume 3 by george w m reynolds section 51 the lawyer's office a few days after the events just related the following scene took place at mr howard's office in golden square it was about four in the afternoon and the lawyer was seated in his private room at a table covered with papers when a clerk entered and announced that sir christopher blunt and his lady had just arrived his lady with him eh exclaimed the solicitor well show them in at once and accordingly in a few minutes the worthy knight with charlotte or we beg her pardon lady blunt hanging upon his arm entered the office the old gentleman was all smiles but the quick eye of mr howard immediately perceived that they were to some extent forced and feigned and that beneath his jaunty aspect there was not altogether the inward contentment much less the lithesome glee of a happy bridegroom as for lady blunt she was attired in the richest manner and in all the colours of the rainbow looking far too gaudy to be either genteel or fashionable my dear sir christopher i'm quite charmed to see you exclaimed mr howard rising to welcome his client and the bride your ladyship yes this is my loving and beloved lady blunt howard said the knight pompously a delightful creature i can assure you and who has vowed to devote herself to my happiness come now you great stupid said the lady finish your business here and let us see about the new carriage of all places in the world i hate a lawyer's office ever since i was once summoned to a court of conscience for seventeen shillings and ninepence halfpenny and had to call on the thief of an attorney 
to get him to take it by installments of sixpence a week so you see i can't abear the lawyers no offence sir she added turning towards mr howard but i always speak my mind and i think it's best my dear creature my sweet love ejaculated sir christopher astounded at this outbreak of petulance on the part of his loving and beloved wife pray do not distress yourself my dear sir christopher said the lawyer we are accustomed to sharp rebukes from the ladies sometimes he added with as courteous a smile as he could possibly manage under the circumstances but pray be seated will your ladyship take this chair and he indicated the one nearest to the fire lady blunt quitted her husband's arm but made an imperious sign for him to bring his chair close to hers and he obeyed her with a submission which left no doubt in the lawyer's mind as to the empire already asserted by the bride i'm very glad you have called to-day sir christopher said the lawyer for he couldn't very well come before sir interrupted lady blunt because we only came back from the matrimonial trip last night mr howard bowed and was preparing to continue when the knight exclaimed my dear sir what is all this to do about the highwaymen who robbed me of the two thousand pounds i thought i told you so particularly that i would rather no steps should be taken in the matter and now the moment i come back to town instead of having all the time to ourselves to gad and cozy together again interrupted lady blunt we are forced to come bothering here at a lawyer's office the ends of justice must be met lady blunt said mr howard dryly in consequence of particular information which i received i caused this thomas rainford to be apprehended and i appeal to sir christopher himself who has served the high office of sheriff and once stood as a candidate for the aldermanic gown of port Sokin, until i was obliged to cut those city people added the knight drawing himself up and why should you cut the city people demanded his wife for my part i'd sooner see the lord mayor show than punch and judy any day and that's saying a great deal for no one can be more fonder of punch and judy than me my dear charlotte exclaimed the knight who now seemed to be sitting on thorns you charlotte at home lady blunt in public sir christopher if you please interrupted the bride but pray let mr howard get to the end of this business well my dear exclaimed sir christopher if it annoys you why would you come i assured you how unusual it was for ladies to accompany their husbands to the office of their solicitors oh i dare say sir christopher cried charlotte you don't think that i'm going to trust you out of my sight do you i'm not quite such a fool as you take me for why even when we are walking along the street together i can see your wicked old eye fixed on the gals lady blunt exclaimed the knight becoming literally purple you 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 do me an injustice so much the better i hope i'm wrong for both our sakes returned her ladyship depend upon it but no matter now let mr howard get on with his story with your permission madam i shall be delighted to do so said the lawyer i was observing just now that having received particular information i caused this scoundrel thomas rainford alias captain sparks to be apprehended and on monday morning sir christopher you must attend before the magistrate to give your evidence but who authorized you to proceed in this affair mr howard demanded the knight what a strange question exclaimed the lawyer evidently unwilling to give a direct answer to it only reflect for a moment my dear sir christopher a robbery is committed you your nephew and myself are outwitted laughed at set at defiance and when an opportunity comes in my way 
i very naturally adopt the best measures to punish the rogue quite proper too sir said lady blunt the idea of any one daring to laugh at sir christopher i'd scratch the villain's eyes out if i had him here to laugh at sir christopher indeed does he look like a man who is meant to be laughed at lady blunt could not have chosen a more unfortunate opportunity to ask this question for her husband at that moment presented so ludicrous an appearance between his attempts to look pleasant and his fears lest he already seemed a henpecked old fool in the eyes of his solicitor that a man possessing less command over himself than mr howard would have laughed outright but with the utmost gravity in the world the lawyer assured her ladyship that nothing could be more preposterous than to laugh at a gentleman of sir christopher blunt's rank and importance and he also declared that in arresting thomas rainford he had merely felt a proper anxiety to punish one who had dared to ridicule the knight after having robbed him lady blunt was one of those capricious women who will laugh at their husbands either as a matter of pastime or for the purpose of manifesting their own independence and predominant sway but who cannot bear the idea of any other person taking a similar liberty she therefore expressed her joy that mr howard had caused rainford to be apprehended and declared of her own accord that sir christopher should attend to give his evidence on the ensuing monday for she would go with him well my dear since such is your pleasure observed the knight there is no more to be said upon the subject i will go my love and i think that when the magistrate hears my evidence he will feel convinced that i know pretty well how to aid the operation of the laws and that i have not been a sheriff for nothing although sprung from a humble origin oh pray don't begin that nonsense sir christopher exclaimed the lady or i shall faint it is really quite sickening at that moment the door opened somewhat violently and mr frank curtis entered the room ah sir christopher my jolly old cock how are you exclaimed that highly respectable young gentleman whose face was dreadfully flushed with drinking and who smelt so strong of cigars and rum punch that his presence instantly produced the most overpowering effect mr curtis began the knight rising from his chair and drawing himself up to his full height i come it's no use to be grumpy over it uncle interrupted frank matrimony doesn't seem to agree with you very well since you're so soon put out of humour ah my dear char my dear aunt i mean beg your pardon quite a mistake you know but really you look charming this afternoon get out with you do cried lady blunt who was somewhat undecided how to treat mr curtis what doesn't matrimony agree with you either my dear and much respected aunt ejaculated frank why i once knew a lady who was in a galloping consumption given up in fact and the undertaker who lived over the way had already begun to make her coffin for he knew he should have the order for the funeral when all of a sudden a young chap fell in love with her married her and took her to the south of france where i've been by the by and brought her home in six months quite recovered and in a fair way to present him with a little one a pledge of affection as it's called mr curtis i am surprised at you exclaimed sir christopher in a pompous and commanding tone to talk in this way before a lady who has only recently passed through that trying ordeal i'll be bound to say it wasn't so recent as you suppose old buck cried frank staggering against the lawyer's table sir lady blunt has only been recently very recently married as you are well aware said the knight sternly and now let me tell you sir that the detestable devices schemed by miss mordaunt and you have recoiled upon yourselves 
miss mordaunt and me exclaimed frank now unfeignedly surprised why i never spoke to miss mordaunt in my life the monster half screamed lady blunt the audacious liar vociferated the knight pretty names very pretty said frank coolly but i'm rather tough thank god and so they won't kill me this time but i can assure you uncle you've got hold of the wrong end of the stick when you say that me and miss mordaunt planned anything against you as i was observed to my friend the count of st omers my lord says i what asked the marquis my lord duke i repeated in a firmer tone cease this nonsense mr curtis interrupted sir christopher blunt sternly yes and let us come along my dear said lady blunt rising and taking her husband's arm your nevy does smell so horrid of rum and cigars and very good things too cried frank ain't they howard me and a party of young fashionables have been keeping it up a bit to-day at my lodgings on the strength of my intended marriage with miss goldberry the rich widow your marriage frank exclaimed sir christopher what how when lord bless you my dear uncle said mr curtis swaying to and fro in a very extraordinary manner you don't half know what kind of a fellow i am while you was away honeymooning and nonsense nonsense indeed exclaimed lady blunt indignantly come sir christopher it's no good staying here talking to mr imperance going to conduit street eh aunt said frank with a drunken leer but by the by you regularly choused me out of five guineas you know aunt and something else too eh what said sir christopher turning back mr curtis do you dare accuse lady blunt of having made a very great fool of me but a much bigger one of you old fellow added frank and snapping his fingers in his uncle's face he exclaimed i don't care a penny for you sir christopher in a few days i shall marry mrs goldberry you're very welcome to be as happy as you can with your abigail there so remember we're cuts in future sir christopher since you want to come the bumptious over me the knight was about to reply but his better half drew him hastily away from the lawyer's office saying come along you great stupid what's the use of staying to dispute with that feller the door closed behind the happy couple and mr frank curtis throwing himself into the chair which lady blunt had just quitted burst out into a tremendous fit of laughter you've gone too far frank a great deal too far said the lawyer shaking his head disapprovingly sir christopher has been a good friend to you and although he has committed an egregious error in running off with that filly still what do i care interrupted frank i proposed to mrs goldberry yesterday and she accepted me after a good deal of simpering and blushing and so on she's got five thousand a year and lives in splendid style in baker street i made her believe that i wasn't quite a beggar myself but all's fair in love and war as my friend the late prince of st omers used to say in his cups but what about this fellow rainford how the deuce did he come to be arrested i received information of his residence answered howard coolly and i gave him into custody accordingly it's very odd continued frank but i met him last sunday night and i don't mind telling you that we went into the middle of hyde park and had an hour's wrestling together to see who was the better man i threw him nineteen times running and he threw me seven then i threw him three times and he gave in so we cried quits for all scores and i gave him my word and honour that nothing would ever be done against him in respect to the little affair of the two thousand pounds you may therefore suppose that i'm rather vexed 
the officers had already received instructions to apprehend him at the time your alleged wrestling match came off said the lawyer and your evidence will be required next monday morning and i suppose the whole affair of the robbery will come out observed curtis interrogatively decidedly so you must state the exact truth if you can added mr howard if i can damn it old fellow that observation is not quite the thing coming from you and if anybody else had uttered it egad i'd send him a hostile message to-morrow morning as i did to my most valued friend the marquis of Boulogne, when i was in paris i'll just tell you how that was not now frank interrupted the lawyer because i'm very busy it's getting on for post time and i have not a minute to spare but mind and be punctual at the borough police office on monday morning at ten well if i must i must said curtis but after all i think it's rather too bad for this sparks or rainford or whatever his name is seems a good kind of fellow after all the law must take its course frank observed the attorney in an abrupt dry manner curtis accordingly took his leave and returned to his lodgings where by dint of cold water applied outwardly and soda water taken inwardly he endeavoured to sober himself sufficiently to pay a visit to mrs goldberry for it was literally true that there was such a lady that she lived in splendid style in baker street that frank had proposed to her and that he had been accepted but we have deemed it necessary to give the reader these corroborative assurances on our part in as much as the whole tale would otherwise have appeared nothing more nor less than one of the innumerable children of mr curtis's fertile imagination End of chapter fifty one recording by john brandon